Good morning. good morning. It is so good to be here today. And today we begin chapter 5 in the book of Galatians. We've gone through the first four chapters, the first two sections, and now we enter the last section of this wonderful book. Most of the commentaries that I read puts Ma uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 as the key verse of the entire letter. So let's look at this one. It says, So Christ has set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Now the NIV puts it this way. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. One of the things about Paul is he never divorced doctrine from real life. In chapters 3 and 4 of Galatians, he gave us a very clear and a very profound teaching about how our salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. But now, in chapters 5 and 6, he ties those great truths to the realities of everyday life and our responsibility to live that out. Now, I want you to remember this. Don't write this down unless you want to write it on the side. But this is something that you always need to remember. With great truth comes great responsibility. With great truth comes great responsibility. So the great truth that we have here is so Christ has truly set us free. Now, the responsibility that goes along with that is now make sure that you stay free. So in this, we see what God has done, and then we see what it is our job to do. Howard Voss, the guy I was reading the other day, said the following, although Christ lives in me, and we know that according to Galatians 2.20, Nevertheless, I live. My will must determine to keep standing firm in the hard-won liberty which Christ has made available. That means that you and I, as we go through life, even the Christian life, we have some choices that we need to make. So I do want you to write this down. We all have some choices to make. And these choices that we make on a daily basis is going to determine so much about our Christian life. And we all have some choices. I'm going to give you three choices today. First of all, we each choose the yoke we will be connected to. Now, I realize we are not in the middle of a farming community. And when you say... You're going to choose which yoke you're thinking eggs, okay? But it has nothing to do with eggs, okay? What is a yoke? Well, a yoke is a wooden bar or frame that is used to join animals to enable them to pull a load. It's amazing. You will see these things. It's a common, it's simple and common tool in farming that's been used over the centuries, and it's still in use today. You're going, but today we have tractors. We don't need to do this. Well, many people have tractors. Other people don't. There are some pla places that tractors can't get, and yet an ox or a team of oxen and a yoke can get the job done sometimes where the tractors can't. So we still see this used. Now, in the Bible, it figuratively represents one of two things. Number one, the burden under which we live sometimes. And it talks about a heavy burden that is put on us. Or it talks about the joining of people or systems to accomplish a goal. You may recall the verse that says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Why? Because it says, 
if you and an unbeliever are in something together, it's going to be hard to go in the same direction because you're going to want to pull toward God and they're going to want to pull away from God. So it's very difficult to get a job done in a relationship like that. And it's in any number of relationships. Because why? Because these two things don't work together well. So this is where it talks about a yoke. Now the Apostle Paul, as he is writing here in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, says the following. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you all. Now he's talking here about fulfilling a law, a law of Moses, the law of circumcision. It says if you're going down that road, you're not following Christ, you're following the law. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. In other words, if you're going to say, I'm going to be right by God because I keep this commandment, then you have to keep all of the commandments. You can't pick and choose the one you want. You have to do it all or you do another route. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Christ's way was the way of grace. Man's way was the way of following rules. He said if you're trying to be right with God by following rules, then you're not on the route of grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The Galatians, the people from this church that Paul is writing this letter to, had been set free from the yoke of slavery to sin. But now... They were considering connecting themselves to the yoke of religion. Ooh. The yoke of religion. The yoke of religion, as Paul says over and over again, is hard and heavy. It's a burden no one can completely carry. It enslaves us to others. As you look around the world today, you can look at many people who are devoted to a religion, and it is tough. It can be extremely hard. You see people who are wholly devoted to it, and it, it, it can be physically, it can be emotionally, it can be financially burdensome just to keep up. Why? Because you're putting on yourself something that someone else has said you need to do to be right with God. Many times, stuff that they don't even do. Why? Because when picking a list, we're always going to pick a list that's convenient to the person giving the list out. So the yoke of religion. But on the other hand, Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. Following Jesus, it frees us to fulfill God's will for our life. I remember years ago I was reading this and one of the commentators talked about this passage. And he said, never forget that Jesus was a carpenter. And he was a master carpenter. Jesus didn't do anything halfway he did it excellent. And it said, as he went, and as they look at this, he said, Jesus was known in his village for making custom, tailor-made yokes for the animals. 
When something is custom made for you, it just fits right. Have you ever had a custom made suit, for example? Or a custom made dress? Or a custom made, let's go for the big stuff, a custom made bike just for you? I mean, it's your measurement, it's your leg, it's your arm, it's your, it's, it's everything, it's just perfect. Or, or for the new ones, custom made golf clubs just for you, just, just, just so the ermit feels included. Yeah, when, when you have something that's made for you, specifically, it's just better. Why? Because it's tailor-made for you. And Jesus' yoke, being tied to him, Jesus takes everything and says, I'm going to make this just for you. So that you can follow this. Just you. It's hard being someone else. Would you agree to that? It, it's hard to be like someone else. It, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't, it doesn't set right. And yet, when something is custom made, it's just right. And Jesus was known for that. So when he said the following, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. They all knew, oh yeah, that was the good yoke. That was the one that made getting the work done so much better. And it still is. But you and I choose the yoke that we're going to use. Second, we each choose the course on which we are going to run the race. Now, I began working on this message two weeks ago. I didn't know I was going to get COVID and not feel like coming. And Albert came and he preached and it was wonderful. I didn't know, but when I was writing this, when I was working on this, the background for what we did before and after was watching the Olympic Games. And that wasn't lost on me as I'm talking about this race and I'm thinking about all these people that are running. And that's exactly what the people had in mind when Paul wrote it. That's why he talked about this so often, because this was something very, very common for them. Notice what it says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. It says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Paul used the imagery of races quite often. In fact, as you go through his different letters, he, he talks about running the race and being a part in the race and, and, and the prize for the race and all this. But as he does, it's important to notice that he never used this image to tell people how to be saved. Because salvation is not a race that we get the prize of salvation. That would be by works. No, salvation is a once and done thing. It's a decision that we make to accept Jesus Christ by faith. It's not a race. He always used the image to talk to believers about how to live the Christian life. They were already saved. They were already citizens of heaven. One author said, a contestant in the Greek games had to be a citizen before he could compete found it interesting one of the gentlemen that was doing the triple jump in the Olympics quite an interesting sport eight days before the competition 
he got his citizenship and permission to represent the country he represented in the Olympics. He couldn't have been in the Olympics without first being a citizen of that country to represent them. And in Greek games, you had to be a citizen before you can compete. We become citizens of heaven through faith in Christ. Then the Lord puts us on our course and we run to win the prize. We do not run to be saved. We run because we're already saved and want to fulfill God's will in our lives. But rather than picturing these wonderful stadiums with these wonderful white lines that go all around and everybody staying in their lanes, I want you to think about this as, as an off-road, a cross-country race where runners were constantly knocked off course, where if they got close together, some might choose left, some might choose right, uh, some might get bumped and rolled down a hill. All of these things could happen. That's the kind of race. And he says to them, who cut in on you and deviated you from the course that you were on? The Judaizers, as they were called, these people trying to get tell people that they were right with God by obeying all of the old laws of Moses. They were the ones that were cutting in on those who had come to Christ by faith. They were the ones that Paul says eventually they were going to pay the penalty for doing that. Now here's the reality. Write this down. We each choose either the course of works or the course of grace. That's your choice. Are you going to be right with God by grace? Or are you going to try to pull it off on your own? You can't run down both paths. They don't both go to the same place. That's a choice that you and I make as we live our Christian life. Third choice we have here. We each choose how to use the liberty we've been given. It says Christ has made us free. And what are we going to do with that? Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says the following. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. What's he saying? He said, listen, we've been given this freedom. And what are you going to do with it? You know, some people think that freedom means I can do what I want. I can do what I want. I've heard people say this. It says, look, I know that I'm not under the law anymore. I can do what I want. When it's all said and done, God will forgive me of my sins. He's paid for all my sins, past, present, future. So, so basically, I can just do what I want. Well, Paul would beg to differ with you, and he says it in a whole bunch of different places. But do you really think that Jesus would die to let us simply have our own way about things? Is that, is that really it? Jesus died so that I can do what I want to do? I don't think so. I don't think so. Paul is very clear. He says, do not use your freedom to indulge your flesh. In other words, don't use the freedom God has given you to get what you want in the situation. 
It's not about you. It's about him. And then he makes it about others. So it's not about you. So I have the freedom to do X. Well, if I know, and he says this in the book of Romans, if I know that what I'm going to do is going to be an offense, it's going to make somebody else stumble, then you know what? I better not do that. Why? For them. Not because I don't have the freedom to do it. But if, my, if me using my freedom in front of this person will hurt them spiritually, it's better that I not do it. I'm going to ask you this. Would a life of grace do less than what was considered standard under the law? Think about this in terms of your personal holiness. If, if, if under the law we were supposed to be set apart in a certain way, do you really think that by grace means that's not important? Personal holiness? Well, g- give me a list. No, I'm not going to give you a list. Why? Because anytime I give a list, you'll find a loophole. Yes or no? We all look for loopholes. And if I give you a list, I'm going to give you a list that's easy for me to follow, regardless of you or not. I mean, if I say, well, on my list is you, you, you don't smoke, that's easy for me because I've never smoked, didn't like it. All you got to do in Brooklyn is just walk down the street. You can get the smell of what everybody else is smoking. That's a whole different issue. But as we're doing this, it's, it's not about our li- in our personal holiness. Would grace mean I do less, or would grace mean I do more? In, in, in devotion, should I be less devoted or more devoted? Not because of a list of rules, Not because I have to be to be right with God, but simply because of everything God has given me, I am more devoted to Him, not less. And the issue of your personal stewardship, all the things that God has given you, if if the law said this, are you going to do what's less under grace? I remember Omar and I were talking about this years ago, and and he's the first one that mentioned it. He said, if under the law they used the tithe, how would grace be anything less than that? Wow, that's got a point. So under grace, we do more for the Lord, not less. A life of freedom means doing what we should because of the wonderful grace extended to us by God. In the last verse there, Paul tells us that it can all be summarized in this, love. It involves our love for God And it involves our love for our neighbor. But it all comes down to love. More grace demands from us more love. More love for God. More love for others. Not because I have to. But because I want to. Because of everything God has done for me. Let me give you another perspective on love. As I said, if you were here last week, Pastor Albert came and he he gave us some wonderful things from 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. And it it was wonderful teaching. And as he did it, it was funny because I had been thinking about the same passage 
but for this message, when it talked about love. Now, what he did is he went to 1 Peter 4 and verses 4, uh, 7, 8, and so on. I want to use just the first point, two points, but I want to turn them around. In, in 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. And here it is. For love covers a multitude of sins. Remember, Albert shared with us a story about a wall with all its defects. And, you know, you know, it's not quite straight and maybe has a hole here or there. But then somebody comes in and, and, and he starts putting plaster over the wall. And how someone who really knows their stuff can go in and cover over the imperfections and it just looks wonderful. And he says, when we are loving someone, it changes them in our eyes. Why? Because our love covers a multitude of sin. Let me give you another example of this. Beverly and me. You haven't noticed, but I'm not the guy she married. Okay? That 155-pound, strong legs actually had a six-pack. I've traded it in for a keg. But all of these things, I'm not the same one. And yet, amazingly, she loves me. And her love covers up my imperfections. I'm just a good-looking wall. Bigger wall than she married, but a wall. And you know, that's how I have always taught this passage. When we love someone enough, whatever their imperfections are, it kind of covers over them. And that's why we always say we have to love one another in church. Why? Because there's a lot of imperfection sitting out here. And so we, we have to love, and when we do it with love, that covers all those imperfections. But let me give you another perspective about that, okay? What if, by us loving, it covers our imperfections? Not the other person. Our imperfection. Again, personal example. When my dad finished language school, after a full year of studying Spanish, these were the parting words from this godly teacher, Mr. Johnson. You will never preach in Spanish to where people will understand you. That's at the end of the course. And we go to Peru. And Dad's Spanish was not really good. In fact, it was kind of bad. I was a little kid, and I knew this ain't right. <laughs> I mean, I learned more from the neighbor kid than Dad had learned all year. And as, as, as he's there... He had something, though, that was amazing. He loved people. He loved the president of the company, and he loved the doorman that held the door to get you in the company. It didn't make any difference, here or here. I remember him telling me, Russell, you be as nice to that guy as you are to that guy, because that guy is going to get you in places that he may keep you out of. Think about that. He loved everybody. He believed that the gospel and what was in the Bible and the things that the Bible taught on every subject would improve the life of anyone so much that it would even take the doorman and make him the president someday 
if he just followed what the Bible said. You want to know something? Dad's love covered a multitude of grammatical sins in his preaching. What if the love that we're called on is really what makes us look better, not just the other one? Love. But Albert's first point, and really it was Peter's first point, was in verse 7. It said, the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. This week, Oscar and Caesar and David and I went to Brooklyn. You ever heard of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir? We know where they sing. We, were, we went to the church. There was a conference that was being held at that, but it was in the background of the church. And so we went, and we went to their Tuesday at noon prayer time. Who shows up at church Tuesday at noon to pray? Several hundred, thank you. And then we went back that night at 6 and went to their prayer service that night. Amazing time. And then during the day, several different pastors challenged us into the area of prayer. The pastor of that church, Jim Cimbala, and if you're interested in the church, pick up the book Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. Amazing book, amazing story, all true. The pastor of the church made this statement. If preaching good sermons were all it took, and I put in parentheses, for churches to grow. If preaching good sermons were all it took, most churches would be full. But they are not. It takes earnest and disciplined prayer. Most of us here have heard far more from the Bible than we're doing. As I said the other day, it's not what we don't know that gets us in trouble. It's what we know and don't do that gets us in trouble. Another pastor said, maybe what we should do is shorten our sermons. Shorten our sermons and spend more time praying about what it said that we would honestly obey and not just hear. So I went back to the hotel room, got my computer out, had the message already done, and I just started cutting stuff out. That's why if you look at your bulletin, you have a page and a half instead of two pages. And what I want us to do is this. I want us to stop for a minute, and I just want us to pray. There are people here today who have been here and heard the gospel, heard that Jesus loves them, heard that they are sinners and need Jesus. They, they, they know all of what it says and yet have never, ever asked Jesus to forgive them their sins come in their heart. They've never accepted the gift. We need to pray that they do. Because if they die, they're not going to ask them, did you ever go to church? They're going to ask, did you accept the gift that my son gave you? And we need to pray for the people that come, but simply have never said, here I am, Lord, I need you. But we also need to pray for ourselves. Because you and I make these choices every day in all of these areas that we've talked about. And maybe as you heard one of them today, there was something in there that kind of just, kind of, it's like, Russell, move on to another point. 
Maybe that's the one you need to take to the Lord in prayer right now. Say, Lord, I don't want to do my way. I want to do it your way. Marcel, do we have others that are going to come? Ask those who he's asked to come up here. and Let's just stand up here in front. And these people are simply here so that if you want to pray with someone, you can come up and pray with them. If you want to come up here and just pray by yourself, please feel free to do so. Or if you want to pray right where you are. But in particular, if you want to ask the Lord to come into your heart today, if you want to be saved, please come. Talk with one of these people. But let's just take a time. Those of you that are watching online, we're going to break away now. But I encourage you to stop and just pray about what God's Word has said to you today and ask the Lord to help you to do it. So let's bow our head now.